So Rachel is a Massachusetts certified educator. She's the, a programming partner with the Museum of Natural History, the Girl Scouts of Massachusetts, Sudbury Valley Trustees, of course, and the Waters Farm Preservation. She's a contributing writer for Now Forager in the Cook's Cook Magazine and was featured in the Boston Globe, Bay State Parents Magazine, Worcester Telegram, um, television talk shows and documentaries and other media and print. She comes from a long line of foragers, including her great grandfather, Arthur W. Fairbanks, founder of the Boston Mycological Club. And I didn't know that, that's really cool. And for those of you who don't know what the Mycological Club is, it's mushrooms. So uh, welcome and I'm going to turn it over to you and you can share your screen whenever you're ready and enjoy everyone. Thanks so much, Debbie. Um, it's really great to be able to offer programming with the Sudbury Valley Trustees. Um, saving our wild spaces, like, uh, like Krista said, is more important than ever. So I'm really glad to be able to support, support SVT um, in any way I can. So um, during this webinar, what I'm gonna outline are some guidelines on how to get started on your wild food and medicine journey, some identification, safety and preparation guidelines, and also a bit about foraging ethics and sustainability. Foraging is an exciting hobby that can quickly develop into a passion, and believe me, I know, um, but it's a healthy passion. Foraging, uh, there's so many benefits both to your body and for your mind, and you don't need much in a way of supplies. So you just start out with the same way you would for a normal hike. You would you know, bring a backpack with some water and uh, make sure that you have some sunscreen on and some insect repellent. But in addition to your normal hiking preparations for foraging, you would bring also some very inexpensive supplies. So you're gonna need, obviously, some collection bags. So plastic is great for uh, springtime when you're collecting greens that can wilt because you might wanna get some salad greens and what you do is you put your salad greens in the plastic bag and you put a little bit of water in there and just a few drops of water will create basically a little rain cloud inside your bag and it will keep all of your leafy greens from wilting before you get home. But for other things that are not green and leafy, like mushrooms, seeds, and nuts, you're gonna want a paper bag or a cloth bag. Um, mushrooms also are great. A basket is great for that. And you're gonna need some shears or bypass pruners um, so you can cut and for all you MacGyver fans out there, I really like to bring my Swiss Army knife, but you can you know, use any other type of knife uh, as long as you've got you know, a way to keep the blade safe. And if you're going for things like stinging nettles or things that have um, a lot of thorns, you're gonna want some garden gloves or some type of way to protect your hands. So other than that, you really don't need like any expensive supplies. It's, it's um, not an expensive hobby and it will also save you some money. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And um, I always recommend to have a couple of foraging guides. Now there's some apps out there, you know, you can load some apps on your phone. And I've checked some of these out just because uh, my students asked me, hey, how's this app? Hey, how is that app? And um, in my experience, the free ones, like the Google type ones, are not very accurate at all. So um, I, I'm not saying don't use the apps, but um, they will, some of them will be more accurate than others. Picture this, um, I found to be pretty accurate, but picture this will bring up um, two or three different plants and maybe only one of will, them will be right, or it might bring up the wrong plant. So it might, you know, an app might help you start to maybe figure out what, what kind of plant you're looking at, but you really need to have identification skills. So we're gonna go over that during class as well. And you definitely need a real foraging guide. So there's lots and lots of guidebooks out there. Some of them, um, like the Peterson and Audubon guides, are regional. So like for this one here, it's for the Central and 
North America. This is the Peterson Guide for our area here in New England. Audubon also has a North American uh, foraging guide. There's mushrooming guides put out by Peterson and Audubon. And um, these are great. Um, I find that there's a lot of strengths and weaknesses to the foraging guide. So I ended up buying several different ones and there's, I enjoy the strengths of each one. So for example, um, one of my favorites for this area, Northeast Foraging by Alita Meredith. She actually lives here in Massachusetts. I really like hers. It, it doesn't cover a ton of plants, but what she does cover, she's extremely thorough and the photographs are really great. Um, she has a section in the front with a little botany in there. Um, you don't have to be a botanist to forage, but you do need to know a few botany tips. So for example, this might help you out, botany in a day. You will not, you're gonna need more than a day to read this book. Um, it's just a cute name, but what this will do for you is it will get you familiar with plant families. So we're gonna talk a little bit about plant families during this presentation. But I found this book to be very helpful uh, to get, you know, the basic botany skills and knowledge uh, down that you need to be a safe forager. So these are just, you know, some books that I enjoy. And then, of course, there's books put out by foragers um, that have become like a household name in foraging, like Wild Man Steve Brill. He's the first, um, my first influence. He was one of the first foragers to uh, teach in the United States, and he's out of New York City. Um, Samuel Thayer, he has put out a, several books. I really enjoy Samuel Thayer's books. Um, one of the things I really like in this book here, which is uh, just, you know, the forages harvest, is there's a section in here that tells you, it, it shows you the plant and then it says which parts are edible on the plant and what time of year to look for that part of the plant and forage it. Now, of course, you know, with different regions and different parts of the United States, these might be off by a couple of weeks, but at least it lets you know what parts of the plant are edible and which ones are edible first and kind of gives you an idea of what am I going to look for at what time of year. So that's a fun feature in this one. Um, and there are also a ton of guides out there if you're interested in medicinal plants because as a forager you're going to get familiar with the medicinal value of plants you might want to get yourself you know some herbal guides as well um, but herbalism is a whole nother world but um, you're, you're going to get to know these plants now you can google them and i don't say yeah i say don't don't forget about <clears throat> googling a plant but you might end up on a website that's giving you the wrong information. <clears throat> you're going to have your, your guide and you're going to also surf the web. If you surf the web, make sure that you have a good, reputable source. So foraging benefits. One of them would be there's a lot of plants that are good for allergies, right? So one of the um, obvious benefits here is that um, wild food has a higher nutritional value than the food you find in the supermarket. The soil hasn't been depleted of nutrients, plus the foods themselves are higher in nutrients. So you're going to find much, you know, 100 to 1,000 times higher um, vitamins and minerals in each serving of wild food. And like I said, it doesn't cost you much to get started. And um, my kids really enjoy it, and it sure makes um, my kids want to hike more when they find some little trail nibbles and things. It's, it's a very family-friendly hobby. Make sure that you explain that there's poisonous plants out there, and if you are, hike, are foraging with children, that they know not to eat anything until they show it to you first. So you're going to save money on groceries, obviously. Um, if you're eating wild food, it doesn't cost anything, and you can, you know, really fill out your pantry with wild food, and um, especially if you can preserve it, 
and you know how to can and things like that, boy, you're going to start saving some serious money and you're going to be eating much healthier food. Um, sustainable foraging is good for the environment. So if you are, for example, up here at the top, you see autumn berries. These are an invasive species. They're horribly invasive. So if you collect these berries, there's going to be less berries seeding and um, spreading this bush. And it's going to um, be great for the environment because you, there's going to be less of those invasive species out there. And um, it will help the native species have more room to grow. And, you know, just in general, um, learning about this, your natural world around you is, is just great for you and also great for your kids and your grandkids. It's a great thing to learn. So there are four seasons to foraging, but they're not the four seasons that we're used to. There's early spring, which has sadly gone by, but um, in early spring, we're talking like, you know, March, um, even, even February, late February, you can dig for roots, then rhizomes, shoots, and sprouts. Mid to late spring is the next season, so actually there's two seasons to spring. You can still get some shoots that come up, the shoots that come up later, and salad greens, and stalks and buds, all kinds of medicinal and edible flowers and herbs in mid to late spring, which is what we're in, you know, right now, late spring, early summer. There's lots and lots of edible flowers. And in the summer, seeds and nuts and mushrooms and more of those edible flowers and herbs and berries. And fall is great, uh, the best time for mushrooms, you know, so, some mushrooms and, um, and obviously seeds and nuts and same thing. And even in the winter, if the ground isn't frozen, you can go out and dig up roots and rhizomes. So there is wild, you know, wild food available in the winter. And you can get things like crab, apple, and rose hips. Um, after a few freezes, they're actually more palatable. They get, they're less bitter. Start with edibles that have no poisonous lookalike. So speaking of children, I always start them with wood sorrel, which is um, something I ate as a kid and um, I did what you're not supposed to do. I went around tasting things um, and other kids thought it was weird, but this was one of the things that I would eat and they're actually shamrocks and there's no poisonous lookalikes. Um, some people confuse these with white clover and uh, the difference here would be that if you see these three leaflets, they are perfect. Each one is a perfect heart and on uh, white clover, each of the three leaflets is an oval shape, not a heart shape. And also you see the flower has petals and um, clover has those florets and it looks like a pom-pom, like a Horton, here's a, a who flower. Um, that's what clovers look like to me. But um, look in your guides because on, um, you know, a lot of guides will tell you, especially like this one here, Northeast Foraging, if you're in Massachusetts, she will tell you if there's any poisonous lookalikes. Now, there's a, only a few plants that don't have poisonous lookalikes, but your guide should tell you if there's any poisonous lookalikes to plants. And I suggest for your first, you know, your first season foraging, um, don't eat any plants that have poisonous lookalikes. You can, you know, try to identify them and go through their identification process, but don't consume any plants that um, have poisonous lookalikes. So here's sheep sorrel, that's another good one. Um, down here, I have wine berries, um, the bottom left. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but the raspberry family doesn't have any poisonous lookalikes. So um, I know these look like raspberries, but they're actually wine berries. And um, over here to the right, we have false strawberries. So obviously, the look-alike to strawberries is false strawberries and you can eat them both. These guys don't have much flavor, but they're perfectly edible. So to identify your edibles, obviously you're going to be using your guide and you're going to be looking for things called key identifiers. And key identifiers are just identifying features that have to be there on that plant 
tree or mushroom. And if those identifying features are not there, then you haven't identified that plant or tree or mushroom. So for example, uh, leaf shape, leaf pattern. So here's a fun one. I don't know if you guys can see me. I'm sure you can see me. You might want to pull my face up here closer. All right, so here's a fun one. This is called sassafras. And there's three, at least three different leaf shapes on sassafras. So you have your simple leaf. that's just a plain old leaf. Simple leaf, one leaf coming off with no leaflets coming off of this leaf stem. But then on the same branch, on the same plant, you've got a leaf that looks like a mitten. And then you've got a leaf that looks like it's on its way to being a compound leaf. It almost has created three different leaflets. So the sassafras has been in this adapt, you know, adaptive form for hundreds of years. And it, it really makes it a fun plant to identify. It's one of the few plants, well, trees, sorry. It's one of the few trees you'll look at that has three different leaf shapes on it. And sassafras, of course, is what um, is traditionally root beer was made from sassafras. And you can make sassafras tea, um, which the Native Americans used to, you know, as a blood purifier, a detoxifier. And it's very tasty. My kids like to nibble on these leaves when we hike because they taste like root beer. So leaf shape and leaf pattern. You're going to look in your foraging guide and you're going to look up all the key identifiers. So if it says it has to have this leaf shape or this leaf pattern or this leaf edge um, or it grows in a certain way, you have to make sure that it does all those things or you haven't safely identified it and you don't want to eat it. So again, we're going to avoid poisonous lookalikes until we really get used to identifying things. So strawberries up here, you can see on the top of the screen here, I have wild strawberries. And um, these are, you know, the, the lookalike to wild strawberries is also edible. So that's a great thing. That's a great plant to start with. And this is a fun thing. Uh, smell can be a key identifier. So not all the time, but you might look in your guides and you'll see that smell. There's, there may be a key smell um, that you need to check with your nose. So another great thing about foraging is that it involves all five of your senses. So you really, when you learn something, you really learn it in the natural human way that we're supposed to learn as human beings. Um, we, we involve all of our senses. You can, you can touch it, you can see it, you can smell it, you can taste it, you can hear it. I don't know how you're going to hear it, but some things you can hear. Um, but you're involving all of your senses, every, all, every one of your senses is um, being activated while you're learning. So what better way to learn something, okay? Um, never eat anything you can't identify, right? We were just talking about that. So if you can't find all those key identifiers, um, maybe you need to familiar, familiarize yourself with a, a little botany to understand what leaf edge is and things like that. So that's what's uh, great for those um, one of the things that's great about your guides is usually if there's some section in the guide that will tell you what leaf shape, leaf pattern, things like that mean. So that's why it's so great to have one of these guides or two or three. You can buy them used. And yes, we do not want to get sick and nothing is worth getting sick over. Um, there's been plenty of things that I've wished that I ha had found and really wanted to find it. And sometimes I thought I found the plants and um, just maybe one of the key identifiers was missing and I was like really wishing that that was the plant, but I didn't eat it and because it's not worth getting sick over. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about leaf patterns. There is um, the opposite leaf pattern. So take a look at this um, black walnut tree. The leaves are growing in an opposite leaf pattern down the leaf stem. This is a compound leaf. And um, all these leaflets are directly opposite each other on the leaf stem. 
the alternate leaf patterns up at the top of the screen here we have Japanese knotweed another horribly invasive plant but edible um, and these leaves are taking turns going down the stem here down, going down the stalk they're alternating down that stalk that's, that's another leaf pattern rosette here we have a wild cucumber um, and this is a native plant and it is protected in some states so if you find this I would just you know leave it alone unless you have a really big patch they're not protected here in Massachusetts so you could maybe taste one here's the root right that's the edible part is this little root down here maybe taste one you know because I, I native plants I don't like to consume unless there's a lot of it and um, and that that it's a renewable resource you know so I, I would eat like native weeds renewable weeds uh, but when it comes to native plants like this one here I usually leave them alone I'm, I'm not starving and I can find some other things to eat but I'm, I'm showing you the the world leaf pattern w-h-o-r-l-e-d with this wild cucumber root and down here at the bottom is plantain and I have that down there because it's growing in a rosette form remember I was talking about rosettes um, and that you collect rosettes at the beginning of the year so for example dandelions grow in a rosette and like this round pattern um, flat on the ground and so does plantain plantain is a great first aid plant so there's you're going to find there's a lot of um, very very valuable first aid plants so plantain is one of those it's great for disinfecting and treating cuts scrapes burns and it there's nothing better for bee stings or wasp stings than a plantain leaf chewed up and put onto the sting and that's called a spit poultice so um, plantain just grows all over the place I'm sure you recognize it um, it grows in the grass and and I I can't tell you how many times I have had to chew up one of these leaves they're edible but they're very bitter and put that spit poultice on my kids my husband um, friends whoever got stung and 15 to 20 minutes later there's no swelling there's no sting um, and it's it's absolutely amazing so I make solves from plantain and from um, jewel weed which is this plant can't go back huh this plant here with the uh, yellow to orange flower is called jewel weed and it is uh, what the Native Americans traditionally use for poison ivy and it's also incredible for eczema so I've, I've saved a lot of money on dermatologist appointments for my kids no longer having to um, take them to get prescribed steroids for eczema and um, and getting steroids for poison ivy because I'm so allergic I don't have to go and get steroids for poison ivy because I just put solve on and um, I also extract this plant into soaps so that I can wash off the poison ivy say a plant is edible but that doesn't mean that you can eat it raw necessarily like for example um, elderberry elderberries are poisonous unless you cook them and that's why we have elderberry syrup and, and everything elderberry has been cooked to cook out the uh, the toxins so um, just because they say something's edible doesn't mean that you don't have to cook it first you again you're going to be looking at your guides and seeing how to prepare that plant and a plant can be edible at one stage of growth but then no longer edible for example fiddleheads here we've got some ostrich ferns over here and uh, cinnamon fern over here and at this stage it's it's a shoot sort of like as, asparagus you you only eat asparagus as a, as a sprout you're not or shoot you're not going to eat asparagus once it's turned into that fern type um, adult form same here with fiddleheads they're delicious and edible you have to cook them because there's an enzyme in in fiddleheads that will deplete your body of vitamin B so you need to cook them but they're really only edible at this stage and then they turn into a fern and then it's too woody and your body can't um, process it. it's too fibrous 
and then some parts of plants are edible while other parts may not be. So um, I, I would get that a lot in my classes where someone would say, oh, I can eat um, this part of the plant. So that means the whole plant is edible. Not necessarily. There's very few plants that um, all parts of it are edible. Like for example, cattails. There's so many different parts of the cattail that's edible. And um, you know, so for example, pokeweed. You can only eat pokeweed as a shoot and you have to cook it or it's poisonous. And then once it's become taller than like say 10 inches, it is so poisonous you can't even cook out um, all the toxins, you can't eat it at all. So look up, make sure that you're eating the edible parts of the plant, um, that you know that you need to cook it or not. And all again, all of that will be in your, your guides. So that's why the guides are so important. You may look up a plant on a website and it will just tell you the medicinal value, but it won't tell you um, how to prepare the plant. Or you might look up, you know, something on the internet and it will just tell you how to identify it, but it won't tell you how to prepare it so that it's, you can eat it. So that's why it's so important to get, you know, more comprehensive guides and, um, you know, some of these other Authors will actually have recipes and cooking ideas and preservation ideas, how to dry the plant, how to can the plant uh, or mushroom. And that's why I really, you know, am pushing these guides and because um, I enjoy seeing those recipes and, and trying those ideas. So we'll go. Oh, one species of a plant ed may be edible while other species are not. So that's why I have these two photos here. Now these are, are cinnamon ferns and some people will eat the cinnamon fern fiddleheads while most foraging guides will tell you that they are not edible. Most foraging guides will tell you that the only the ostrich fern fiddleheads are edible. I eat like three or four different types of, of ferns but that's because I look up things like plant families and things like that and I will stick to the plant family and, you know, we'll get to this. There's some plant families that you can eat everything in the plant family and some of the, some plant families where some of the um, members of that family are edible and some are poisonous. So we'll get to that in a second. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna go to the next one. So this is what we're talking about. The parsley family there are thousands of species in there and it includes things like dill and parsnips and celery and of course parsley but it also includes things like poison hemlock which will kill you and giant hogweed if you pick giant hogweed and get the sap on your hands it is phototoxic so when you have that sap on your hands and then you're in the sun, it will burn your flesh. So <laughs> know your plant families. Um, and I'm showing you uh, Queen Anne's lace here. And then I'm also showing cow parsnip, which is another one of those uh, phototoxic plants to show you how similar these plants look. Once you've gotten into the same plant family, a lot of these plants look very similar. And I'm pointing out the pot parsley family because there's so many extremely toxic members. I would say stay away from this family until you get really um, experienced with foraging. It's just not worth it uh, until you can really safely identify the plants within this family. And there's plenty of other safer families. Like for example, um, the mustard family. Everything in the mustard family is edible. Garlic mustard, please eat the garlic mustard. It's another um, extremely invasive plant, garlic mustard. So, um, and it also contains a lot of amazing in nutrients like omega-3s and selenium and, and um, other vitamins and minerals. So eat, eat that garlic mustard, look it up and find out what edible parts there are and what when's the best time of the year to eat that. So that the mustard family is safe. So, you know, start with that one too, you know, 
raspberries, mustard, things like that. So continuing to talk about foraging safety, and I'm reiterating again, look for all the key identifiers. So you can't positively identify something unless you have found all the key identifiers and your foraging guides will tell you that. They'll say you need to look for, you know, five, seven, ten, you know, depending on the plant, key identifiers. And if you don't find those, don't, don't eat the plant. I'm not saying don't take it home and collect it and things like that, as long as it's not in the parsley family. Um, and has phototoxic sap. Um, take the plant home, ID it, take photos of it, um, take notes. I, I do silly things like I'll, you know, when I find a plant, I don't know if I can find this page, but I'll take some of the plant home. You know, the, here's a ground bean, hog peanuts. I stuck one of the leaves in the book at that page, makes a great bookmark and it saved that. So you can do fun things like that to make sure that you identify. And, you know, this should be a no-brainer. Know what poisonous plants look like, like poison ivy. At different times of the year, I'm pointing out up here, poison ivy in the beginning of the season looks very different from poison ivy in late spring and summer. Say you finally have identified something and you've identified it beyond a doubt, you found all the key identifiers and you know for sure that you have that plant. If it's the first time you've ever eaten it, there is a possibility that you could be allergic to it. You don't know. I mean, there's, there's, um, you know, there's plants out there that people could be allergic to, like for example, that chicken mushroom. A lot of people can't seem to tolerate that. They have gastric distress. And um, while most people eat it no problem at all, there's, you know, there's a lot of people that have reported having gastric distress from eating chicken mushrooms. So if it's the first time that you've ever eaten something, any wild edible, you only have a small amount and then you wait, you know, several hours, you know, eight hours, whatever and make sure that you're not going to have an allergic reaction to that because you just, you just don't know. I mean, I have a friend who ate so many carrots <laughs> that he became allergic to carrots. So, you know, everything like wild carrots, anything, you know, in the carrot family, it's just the parsley family, he's allergic to. So he can't have like celery or wild carrots or anything like that. He made himself allergic to carrots by eating lots of carrots all the time to, sit, to lose weight. So here's a good one for foraging safety. You might find a gorgeous mushroom on your neighbor's lawn, but if your neighbor sprays lots of pesticides, don't eat it because those, those mushrooms and, and any other plants are going to be absorbing those pesticides and you, you're going to eat those toxins. Um, busy roads, you know, want to collect something. I mean, I go crazy at this time of year because I'll be driving down the highway and I see elderberry all over the place on Route 495, and especially this elderberry, and it drives me crazy every year because this is when it's flowering, so you can find it really easily. And I cannot collect any of that because it's on a highway, or if it's on a you know busy roadside, there's all that car and truck exhaust. So don't, don't collect any thing from the busy roadside. And um, properly cook foods that can't be eaten raw. Like for example, I was talking about pokeweed. I have a whole um, YouTube, I have a YouTube channel. I have a whole YouTube on pokeweed and how you have to cook that and discard the water. Don't drink the cooking water and things like that. Um, in order to make that pokeweed edible, what, what you've got to do. So again, you're, you're going to be looking in your foraging guides for that to properly cook your food, you know, your wild food if it needs to be cooked. Um, something else really important is that some wild foods have a high quantity of um, components that might not be good for you if you have certain health conditions. Like for example, there's a lot of um, wild foods that are extremely 
good for you and very, very edible and very tasty, but they have a lot of oxalates in them. So if you have kidney stones or, or certain kidney issues and you need to avoid oxalates, you're going to need to avoid those plants that are high in oxalates. So again, you know, this guide, I know, for example, um, Northeast Foraging, she mentions if there's saponins and oxalates that are in high levels in the plants. And so, you know, people need that need to avoid to avoid things like oxalates and saponins in high quantity or tannins can avoid eating that plant or just eat very small quantities. You know, tannins are very good for you, but there can be some high quantities in the edibles. Wildlife refuges um, and some conservation areas, Audubon Society land, they don't, they don't allow it. So you don't wanna go foraging in those places that you can find plants to identify, like for identification purposes. If you're at a wildlife refuge and you want to take photos of that plant um, to help you identify it, go ahead. Just don't collect anything because um, it's against the rules for that place and we should, we should respect that. We don't want to give foragers a bad name and make it hard for everybody um, to forage things. So um, check conservation area websites because most conservation areas are okay with foraging as long as it's, um, you know, you forage sustainably and, and, um, and you don't disturb the wildlife and things and you don't take too much of a, of a native plant. Um, but check the websites because I have seen some conservation area websites where they say do not forage. And I've gone to some conservation areas and there's been signs up that say no foraging. So um, you need to respect that. There's plenty of places where you can forage, make friends with your local organic farm. Uh, I really love Stern's Farm. Um, they have all kinds of wonderful wild edibles around their fields and in their fallow fields. So find, a, find an organic farm or, or um, a, a um, farm near you where they, they don't mind that you forage. Okay. So what you're going to do when you're foraging is you're going to focus on um, invasive and renewable species. So in other words, weeds, you know, things like red clover and, um, you know, they, there may be some native weeds that even though they're native, they're plentiful and they're renewable, they're annual, they come back every year and there's tons like huge colonies of stinging nettle, for example, you wouldn't forage like a tiny patch of stinging nettle. But if there's a, you know, I, I know where there's colonies that just cover acres of land and, um, you know, you can forage from them because stinging nettle will spread by rhizomes and seeds, two different ways. And, you know, look at how much of that plant is growing and take a small amount, you know, a small percentage of the plants that are growing in that area. But if they're an invasive plant, have at it, you know, um, collect as much as you, as you want because they're an invasive plant and they're, you know, ruining the ecosystem basically. Okay, so like for example, Japanese knotweed and garlic mustard, have all of it you want. <laughs> you know, it, you're really helping out our ecosystem by collecting that and eating it and you're helping your body by um, having a very nutritious plant. Um, Again, you know, native plants should be collected sparingly and only when abundant. That's what I was saying. You know, see how much of that plant is there. Make sure there's a lot and take a small percentage. And if you do collect invasive species like garlic mustard, you want to collect that before it starts to go to seed so that you're not spreading the seeds around. It's not very tasty when, it, when it's at that point anyway, when, the, when it's going to seed. Most greens and salad greens and things like that are not tasty once they've um, gone to seed or even when they start flowering, they're not really as tasty anymore. They get very bitter. So you're gonna be collecting that um, invasive species before it goes to seed. Um, when it, something like um, autumn berries, obviously they, you collecting the berries, don't drop a whole bunch on the ground, you know, try to, try to collect them and take those berries away and cook them before, you know, so don't, um, for example, put them in your juicer and then throw the autumn berry seeds that are still raw, you know, 
or you put them through a food mill, let's say, raw, don't put those raw seeds on your compost pile because then you're going to have autumn berry bushes growing out of your compost pile. Um, and um, leave forage for wildlife. Even invasive species like autumn berries are a huge food source for birds. Um, but I have found huge groves, I mean groves and groves of autumn berry bushes. So I couldn't collect um, any to even impact the, um, the birds in, in that area. So for example, vacant lots. Um, I've gone to vacant lots where there's just hundreds and hundreds of like 10 foot high autumn berry bushes and I collect away and the birds yell at me, the cat birds yell at me and I collect them and you know everybody's got enough food. Um, so you know we, we've got that responsibility to keep future harvests in mind that means that you know you want to be able to come back and harvest this plant again, you want to leave enough for the wildlife. For example, um, wild ramps, you know, they're getting decimated. The ramp population is getting wiped away because people are foraging them and selling them to restaurants. So I don't even harvest ramps. I may like eat one for fun because, um, and the same thing with fiddleheads, people are going and um, collecting all the all of the uh, croziers from the rosette and they're not leaving any behind and what ends up happening is you take all the fiddleheads that are coming out of that croze out of that rosette that fern dies and i don't know why these foragers don't care you know don't they want to come back next year and and forage for that restaurant again in the same spot um or do they just not know that you need to take only you know, like one third or one fourth of the fiddleheads that are coming up, you know, count, okay, or there's four fiddleheads coming up, I'm gonna take one, you know, and then leave the three behind. Um, really, you wanna take from a, you know, from there's should be more than four coming up. But if there's like, say, seven coming up, you're only gonna take like two from that, from that um, fern. So that this is a foraging ethics. We're thinking about, you know, your kids and your grandkids coming back to this um, ostrich fern patch and being able to pick ostrich fern fiddleheads and, and the wildlife, you know, having, having enough food to survive on. What is the percentage um, that you take of that plant or that colony? And it, it varies based on you know what the plant is but what you want to do is you don't want to not kill the plant and or kill the colony of that plant and um, so not only are you learning how to identify the plant and you know how to prepare it safely identify it safely but you also want to learn how to forage that plant sustainably so that it will continue to survive and keep on producing if but again if it's a it's an invasive plant then you're you're going to want to try you know collect that if it's garlic mustard pull it you know <laughs> pull as much of it as you can and then take it home and eat some of it um enjoy eating some of it and and you know properly dispose of the garlic mustard and i think it's great that restaurants are offering wild food because it's so incredibly healthy but there, you know, when you turn it into an industry, um, people are going to abuse that because they're they're doing that for a living. They're collecting it for a living. But um, you'd think they'd also want to sustain themselves and be able to come out back year after year and get those fiddleheads and, and ramps. But maybe they're not, you know, caring. They just need the money. But I, I you know, I'm just putting that out there that there's, you know, the ethics are important because you know, you want to have those future harvests and you also don't want um, invasive species taking over. So say, you, you know, killed all the ramps. Well, then garlic mustard might take over that ramp patch ground. You know, so you, you don't want to um, collect so much of a native species that it gives 
room for an invasive species to come and take over. The things that I make, I make for my family and friends and to give us teacher gifts and things like that. But um, I, I also will do fairs like to, to support um, Waters Farm. I will do a table at Waters Farm. Um, so how can you find me? Some of you already found me on Facebook. My Facebook, Cooking with Mrs. G, everything is Cooking with Mrs. G that I'm on, by the way. Um, my Facebook is also um, a website. So in, when you're a business site on Facebook, you don't have to have a Facebook account to view my Facebook website. So what I do with the Facebook is I will post my finds, I'll say, oh, I found, you know, elderberry today, or, you know, I found a chicken mushroom today, and I'll post, you know, what I did with that chicken mushroom, how did I cook it, things like that. I might have recipe ideas, I might have um, preparation ideas, so it's sort of like a mini blog is, is what my Facebook is. And then, again, Instagram, I'm not as good about posting on Instagram because I'm old and stuff, but um, I do post some. And uh, that's mostly like photos of what I cooked with the wild food. And um, again, it's cooking with Mrs. G. And I have an Etsy shop. I don't sell a lot of my products, only like ones that are easy to mail. But um, I do have an Etsy shop, which is also cooking with Mrs. G. And then my YouTube. But if you look up cooking with Mrs. G on YouTube, you'll come up with my YouTube. And that's where I will you know, have a, a YouTube. I'll just film, you know, oh, I found all these reishi today. And I'll talk about reishi or, you know, any, you know, mushrooms, things like that, that I find. So I want to thank Rachel for coming out tonight with us and um, sharing all your knowledge and getting us all really excited to start exploring this.